Wait a minute. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm joined by my Library Love Fest cohorts. I'm Lainey Mays. Good to be here with you. Hey, everyone. I'm Essie. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really uh, excited and honored to have two uh, brilliant writers with us today. We have Danya Kukafka, novelist. We have Sarah Wyman, our, our nonfiction mystery extraordinaire. And together they have written, um, they've each written a book that um, one fiction, one non. And we've been talking about the Venn diagram of what happens with these two books. Um, Lainey, you're going to do a much better job than I am. I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, I'm so excited to be here. I loved both of your books so, so much. And um, I'm big fans of both of your works. And we have fiction and we have nonfiction, but we're all going to the crux of what's important, women's stories and women that are affected by killers, whether that be fiction or nonfiction. So uh, I'm going to read that quote, Virginia, that you- yeah, Please do. Yeah, this really, really wonderful Publishers Weekly quote that was talking about your book, Sarah, but I think that both of this, this grander theme kind of works. So it says, those he murdered or came close to murdering were and are far more fascinating and complex and worth knowing far more than he was. So that was talking about scoundrel and this true story, but I think that grander theme really shows through in both of our books that we're talking about today. And I know both of you, we, when we got on, you both talked to each other. So I don't know if there's anything you guys want to say before we put you in the green room. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just like what I was saying before we got on the air, that there is this sort of collective unconscious that we're all tapping into in terms of wanting to kind of reframe typical stories about murderers and who we find fascinating and who we sort of hitch our wagons to narratively. And so, and I'm much more interested in kind of reverse engineering and sort of elevating the stories of the women and the girls in particular who get overlooked and who get neglected, who get forgotten. And I did that with The Real Lolita and I really tried to do that with Scoundrel. And that was something having read Notes on an Execution that I really was struck by and taken with that Danya was able to pull that off so amazingly well. Thank you, Sarah. I, I mean, opening your book, I just was kind of blown away by the parallels in the sense of, you know, we're both asking these questions about bad men, right? Why do we love bad men so much? Why do we find them so interesting? Why do we inherently trust them and fall into their spell and into their orbit um, as as so many people did in the real life case that you write about um, and, and in the fictional case that I write about as well. Um, but also more importantly, like what are the consequences of that? Like what are the real world consequences? How does that actually affect real people, mostly real women. Um, so I was just, I was truly blown away by like the many themes that we were both exploring here. Um, so I'm super excited to be here together. Thank you, me too. We're really excited to have you. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, speak with Danya first and, um, and then Sarah will come out of the green room, which means she'll turn her computer back on. And, um, and then we'll, we'll talk to Sarah and then we'll bring Danya back at, at the end. But um, again, we just wanna thank you both so much for coming on. There's so much to talk about. And as you say, Danya, so many parallels. Um, and uh, this is, um, these are important works, fiction or nonfiction. They're, um, they're powerful and they're necessary. And uh, so let's, let's start talking about them. So Danya, uh, if you'll stay and Sarah, we'll talk to you in a little bit. Excellent. Alrighty, let's get going. So we're gonna put the jacket up of notes on an execution while I talk a little bit about you, Danya. So <laughs> Danya Kukavka is an internationally bestselling author of Girl in Snow. That was your debut novel re released in 2017. It was a national bestseller, any next pick, a BNN Discover pick, and it's been optioned for a TV series to, in development. So i um, really excited uh, for your second book, Notes on an Execution, that we 
um, are here to talk about today. Um, it's just such a fantastic read, which we've already been talking about. It, I, I know that at Harper, especially everyone in-house just love this book from the moment that we got it in our grubby little hands. Let me tell you, we were all like, we have to read this now. And um, it, the read is just so beautiful, but it, it's, I can go on, but can you tell us a little bit about the story and uh, maybe maybe your inspiration for why you wanted to write it? Yeah, so I will give you my like official spiel about this book, um, which is that on the surface, this is a novel about a serial killer, um, but actually it's not about him at all. It's about the women in his life who are deeply and permanently affected by his crimes. Um, so the novel opens in a prison cell 12 hours before Ansel Packer's execution. And Ansel is a character you might recognize if you're a fan of true crime, as I think we all here are. Um, he's a middle-aged white guy who's very much guilty of what he's been imprisoned for. So while the book counts down to his potential execution at the hands of the state of Texas, um, it tells actually a much more complicated story about the web of women who are affected by, by his violence. So you have his mother, Lavender, who's forced to abandon him at a tragically young age. You have his ex-wife's sister, Hazel, who watches her twin decline in her marriage to Ansel. And you have Safi, who is the detective who hunts him down for decades. So these women really take up the meat of the book and they tell the story of Ansel in his life, um, but more importantly of sort of the long tentacles of trauma and endurance that male violence always and inevitably leaves behind. Yeah, it, it's so wonderful. And it's our lead read book for winter 22. So if um, anyone's not aware, that is a program for our sales force. We all pick a book every season. We're going to get behind and support. And this was a, an easy selection. Everyone loved it. And um, you're doing such a good job in this book by, by sh putting those women at the forefront. I, I, what Sarah said really hit a note where she was like, I'm trying to reconstruct it. And I feel that way too with this, where it's like, he's filling in the blanks. The women aren't being filled in later. Whereas most true crime kind of sometimes these days is like mm -hmm. women are an afterthought and really we're, we're seeing a full version of these women in his life. Um, but you're also kind of balancing other themes of like what's justice and you know just small themes like what's justice you know, casual <laughs> casual themes over here <laughs> right and wrong you know um so why did you choose those women specifically or in his life like did those change as you were writing Oh yes. Um, so I actually, none of these women existed in the first draft that, of the book that I wrote. Um, when I sat down to write this novel, I wrote it from Ansel's perspective because that felt like the place to start. And they were all characters um, in from his eyes and that draft was not working for a long variety of reasons. Um, but after I sort of sat down to rethink the book, I thought about, um, you know, we see so often victims of violent crime are sort of relegated to this victim space, right? Um, and they're not, they're not allowed to be full people, they're not allowed to have full experiences, um, but uh, like even further than that, I think are the living people affected by violent crime too. So I wanted to get into both of those questions um, about like, you know, what happens when women, women's lives are taken away like what are the deeper questions behind that behind that trope that we see all the time and then also what happens to the communities surrounding those women and their actual physical worlds um which are you know changed forever by the pointless actions of one bad man usually <laughs> so you know these larger questions of of how far violent crime reaches and why were were really what I was interested in here rather than the psyche of the serial killer which is what we see so often yeah and I'm sure that Essie and Virginia have a question but I just want to read this quote really quickly from Ivy Pakoda um which is just so beautiful but also really wraps up I think what the book is it says the story is unflinching and unromantic yet wrenching and devastating in equal measure never falling into the easy trap of sensationalism pushes women to the forefront of a narrative that has too often overlooked them and they all suffer. That's just a really great quote. <laughs> <My heart. laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a comment on uh, from Kimberly McGee here and she says, I was fully drawn into notes on an execution. I almost felt sorry for him at times, which is exactly what the other woman fell for, the charm of a killer. 
Did you find yourself feeling that way while you were writing the book um, for Ansel or were you able to separate that feeling from him? So I took a, an approach here that um, is sort of maybe even a little bit contradictory to my concept of the women, the women, the women, which is, don't quote me on this, serial killers are people too. Um, they have whole lives behind them, right? I mean, what they deserve and how they're punished is another question, but um, so often we see, you know, the bad men um, reduced to the question of like, why did he do it? How did he become like this, right? When actually they've lived entire lives that are irrelevant to their, the crimes they've committed sometimes. So uh, what I did with, An what I wanted to do with Ansel was to focus on the person that he was on a day-to-day -day basis, um, not necessarily just in the moments in which he chose to kill people, which were obviously the moments that changed his life. But um, yeah, for him, I think it was important to me that he was a, a real full person as well as a dumb, bad serial killer. Um, so yes, in some, in some moments, I definitely felt empathy for him, whether that was, you know, um, I don't know, whether that was sympathy or, you know, like really feeling for him and forgiving him would be a different question, I think. Um, Danya, I, I love the book too. I honestly, there's, there's really no good place to, to put it down. And, and so I didn't because, um, because you're learning about, I mean, you fill in all the, it's very interesting that you say that, you know, the, the women that you focused on were not initially in the, the first, um, uh, manuscript, um, because I think it's really interesting that you chose the women that you did to write about all the women that were affected by, by his actions. Um, and um, I, it, for anyone who uh, has access to Edelweiss, there was a terrific behind the book piece that Danya has written, which really sort of fills in the background as to why you wrote the book. But I'd, I'd love to you know, have you talk a little bit about that. But I, the two things I wanted to touch on were that you, um, you know, you were tired of the Ted Bundys. You were tired of the, you know, hearing about everybody knows Charles Manson. Everybody knows, you know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, right? And so, and I think you say at one point, like, and what do you see of them? You know, the flash of the hair. You know, that's the, their sort of second characters, and it, which is terrible. But I also, um, so I want to talk more about that, about your, you know, what really lit the lit the match for this, and also a little bit more about what they would have become. And I don't want to ruin this for anybody who's going to read this book and you all should, but I, I, I just like a little lump in my throat reading the very end, which isn't giving anything away other than to say what would have happened, you know, and he's always talking about that alternate universe, whatever. Well, what is, you know, that alternate universe had they, had they lived and, and the, the numbers and how you just sort of figured, you know, um, you know, how many more births there would have been, how many more lives there would have been touched, how many more positives could have happened had these things not happened. And I just thought that that was so touching. Uh, and it's fun to talk about those two things. Just to sort of like, you know, this group of these well-known, you know, uh, these, these well-known men um, known for horrific things they had done. And also, um, you know, just more about like what the would haves. Yeah, absolutely. So I am so tired of Ted Bundy. I, I cannot believe we're still talking about Ted Bundy now. Um, it's been so many years since he was convicted and killed. And I, like to this day, there are new Netflix series coming out, right? That are like Ted Bundy's newest tapes. And of course I watch them all because I'm, I'm intrigued by this for whatever reason, everyone else is intrigued by this. Um, but I do find that there's a huge lack of, um, of, I guess, web in the story. There's, there's so much running beneath the Ted Bundy story, right? that is really never explored. Um, even the Zac Efron movie, that's technically an adaptation of his girlfriend's memoir, um, basically erases, her name's Liz Kendall, and uh, she wrote a, yes, she, exactly, she wrote a memoir um, about being Ted Bundy's girlfriend during the time of the murders. Um, and they made a movie about her that was actually just about Ted Bundy. Um, and it was like kind of mind blowing that something with that went out of this intention came back with that. Um, Anyway, all this to say, I think there are entire universes out there of people who have been affected by violent crime and their stories are never told. And I find, you know, part of the reason I started writing this book was because I grew up watching TV shows, you know, like Criminal Minds and uh, Law and Order SVU and CSI Miami, which I absolutely love still to this day. Um, 
but I do find if you watch enough of those, you come to see the, you know, the same narrative over and over and over again. You come to see um, the pretty dead white girl, the bad guy who kills her, and then the cops who get, you know, chase him down. Um, and I watched enough of those to feel like, you know, the main question I started with actually was, where's this guy's mom? Like, he, where is his mother? Um, who is this person, right? Who is the person who gave birth to this monster? Um, it's got to be more complex than that, right? Um, and that was how I sort of landed on the women that I decided to write um, their perspectives. So um, in terms of the, the multiverse, I guess we could call it, um, the question of, you know, what would have happened if you made a different choice? There are just an infinite number of possibilities in any scenario of what would happen if you made a different choice. But the consequences of these specific choices that these specific bad men make are so infinitely devastating. And that was what I was really trying to get across here. You know, um, taking away the possibility of a person's entire life um, is so much more than her, you know, dead bodies sprawled across the TV screen for 45 seconds at the beginning of an episode, right? Um, and that, that was what I was really trying to get at there. Yeah, yeah, and that, and you did, because, um, because it's a robbery. You know, obviously it's, I mean, it's a robbery of, of, a li of many, of many lives, mm -hmm. of many lives unborn. And yeah. so um, I, I found that very, um, very touching, really, and very hard to, sad to read. But, but I, I also, um, for folks who are not, um, who, who, you know, don't want to read um, about the, the, the details, good because it's not here and I applaud you for that and do you want to talk a little bit about that um you know I never wrote the details <laughs> um, I was not interested in them um yeah. and I think you know again that gets to the question of going beyond the thing we usually see on the tv screen right um beyond those moments that that make up the story we think we're interested in is actually a much more complex story um and the moments of violence really reduce women I think into mm. those moments right um you know if victims of, of crime are often just remembered for that, right? They're not remembered for the billions of other moments they've lived in their lives. Um, and I kind of didn't want to get, want to um, give him any more than I already had, right? And I also would like to clarify, I did say serial killers are people too. Um, and I think, <laughs> I, you know, I do stand by that, but I also think um, what I was really trying to get out there is the concept that not every serial killer is like a genius evil mastermind of like death and murder, right? They're not like out there trying to like be evil. Well, I'm sure some of them are, but I think psychologically and in terms of just like, you know, the everyday choices you make, um, it's, it's so much more interesting than, oh, he's like an evil genius, right? Um, he's, he's a, a real person. They all are, are real people who make these choices for the reasons they do. So. And he and he has such an inflated sense of self. Oh yeah, you know? <laughs> you have to I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to. Well, I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but um, yeah, there are there are. Let's just say there are moments in his thought process processes when he's like sort of you know, I don't know, escorted by police. Let's just say, <laughs> and he I I'm trying to remember what he compares himself to, but it's. Um, it's it's very it's very the grand. He's the president of the United States. Yes, that's what it is. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Being marched <laughs> down the like tarmac like the president of the United States. Hey, yeah. yeah <laughs> and I think men like that do feed into their own myths, right? They like to believe that they are this evil mastermind. They like to believe that they are smart. They all have to be egomaniacs to do the things they do sometimes. Um, but what I really wanted to show with this was like he's just like a normal bad guy. He's not even that smart. You know, um, and that's what I, I really wanted to get across. You know, there's this myth of like, that's maybe partly what I hate about Ted Bundy is everyone like, is like, oh, he's so smart. He's so cunning. He's so like brilliant and charming. And I'm like, is he though? Like, I, say, I would argue the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like he's just kind of a bad dude. I don't know. And I don't know that it's more complicated than that. So, and people would focus on his looks. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That too. Um, and I think that leads into ego a lot for, for men like that. Um, but yeah, the, the believing that you're smarter than everybody else and then having the world tell you that you are because you managed to kill people. Like, cool, good for you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the mystery is in why their brain works that way. And it kind of, 
I guess comes off as a like, ooh, mysterious. So I don't know what they're thinking. It's like, yeah, they probably don't either. <laughs> yeah, like it's not actually that mysterious. They just made this one choice, this one moment in time. That's that's what it is. Yeah. It it also made me think about um his his very young childhood, his, his short, well, his childhood. Um and which I mean again I'm not giving anything away but it wasn't great <laughs> by any stretch yeah. um, but lots of people's unfortunately have childhoods that aren't wonderful right. by any stretch yeah I had a lot of fun um with uh the character of Safi who um not to give too much away but she she meets Ansel as a young child and later on becomes a detective um and they have very similar upbringings and they make very, very different choices about what to do with themselves in the world. Maybe we should hear a little piece because you have some, you were gonna read maybe from Lavender's section. Yeah. So I will read a little bit. Um, this is my first reading of this book, so yay. Um, so uh, I will read the very beginning of Lavender's section and all you need to know is that it's 1973 and Lavender is Ansel's mother. If there was a before, it began with Lavender. She was 17 years old. She knew what it meant to bring life into the world, the gravity. She knew that love could swallow you tight and also bruise. But until the time came, Lavender did not understand what it meant to walk away from a thing she'd grown from her own insides. Tell me a story, Lavender gasped between contractions. She was splayed out in the barn on a blanket propped against a stack of hay. Johnny crouched over her with a lantern, his breath curling white in the frigid November air. The baby, Lavender said, tell me about the baby. It was becoming increasingly clear that the baby might actually kill her. Every contraction proved how horribly unprepared they were. Despite all Johnny's bravado and the passages he quoted from the medical textbooks his grandfather had left, neither of them knew much about childbirth. The books hadn't mentioned this, the blood, apocalyptic, the pain, white hot and sweat soaked. He'll grow up to be president, John said. He'll be a king. Lavender groaned. She could feel the baby's head tearing at her skin, a grapefruit half exited. You don't know it's a boy, she panted. Besides, there's no such thing as kings anymore. She pushed until the walls of the barn went crimson. Her body felt full of glass shards, a jagged inner twisting. When the next contraction came, Lavender sank into it, her throat breaking into a guttural scream. He'll be good, Johnny said. He'll be brave and smart and powerful. I can see his head, Lav, you have to keep pushing. Blackout. Her whole self converged into one shattering wound. The shriek came then, a mewling cry. Johnny was covered in gore up to his elbows and Lavender watched as he picked up the gardening shears he'd sterilized with alcohol, then used them to cut the umbilical cord. Seconds later, Lavender was holding it, her child. Slick with afterbirth, foamy around the head, the baby was a tangle of furious limbs. In the lantern's glow, his eyes were nearly black. He did not look like a baby, Lavender thought. Little purple alien. Johnny slumped beside her in the hay, panting. Look, he rasped. Look at what we made, my girl. The feeling hit Lavender just in time, a love so consuming it felt more like panic. The sensation was followed immediately by a nauseous tidal guilt because Lavender knew from the second she saw the baby that she did not want this kind of love. It was too much too hungry, but it had been growing inside her all these months and now it had fingers, toes. It was gulping oxygen. Johnny wiped the baby down with a towel and positioned him firmly against Lavender's nipple. As she peered down at the scrunched and flaking bundle, Lavender was thankful for the dark of the barn, the sweaty damp of her face. Johnny hated when she cried. Lavender placed a palm on the ball of the baby's head, those initial traitorous thoughts already laced with regret. She drowned the feeling with assurances, murmured against the baby's slippery skin. I will love you like the ocean loves the sand. They named the baby Ansel after Johnny's grandfather. It gives me chills. Oh, dark, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it was perfect, it was so good. Thank you. It's Her, I just wanted to wrap her in a hug the whole time. <laughs> Oh, well, we have a lot of good, amazing things coming in the chat and a few questions. Let's see. Oh, someone, uh, Jennifer from Jennifer said, Lavender Story broke my heart. Um, 
kudos to the author for her storytelling skills. The books made me so uncomfortable, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I come to that for sure. <laughs> um, somebody mentions uh, that he, Kimberly McGee mentions that he wrote a manifesto to explain why I did the things um, and took control. It was a very interesting touch. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how he was in prison. Like, was he totally okay and just like, well, resigned and guilty? Or like, how does, how does he look to everyone? Um, I think part of what I wanted to do with Ansel Psyche was, like I said, this belief that he is smarter than everyone else, this belief that he's special somehow, because the world tells him that he's special somehow, right? People love serial killers, and he understands that he's sort of feeding into that, right? And so because of this, he has this grandiose idea of himself as a writer, and he's, re he's working on what he calls a theory. And at one point, the one of the characters says, oh, you got a manifesto, buddy? And he's like, oh, it's not a manifesto. It's, you know, it's so much more than that. But it's not. And um, I think I think part of what I wanted to do with his character was really allowing him to um, fall from that idea throughout the course of the book. Like sort of his large character arc is his own recognition that actually he's not special. He's not different. He's not gonna um, be pardoned just because he thinks he's smart, right? Yeah, like he says, manifestos are for crazy people. Oh, mine's a theory. Right, exactly, exactly. He wants to, he, he believes he is, you know, something more. <laughs> there was one more question from Maureen Roberts. Um, she wanted to know how is writing your second novel different from your first? Is it a different experience for you? Yeah, very different. Um, I had a lot of false starts with this one. Like I mentioned, I wrote a couple drafts that had to just go straight into the trash. Um, also this book, my first novel I'd written um, while I was in school, while I was working as a waitress, while I was working in publishing full time um, as an editor. And this book I wrote, uh, I had left my publishing job to write this book as a you know full time writer. Um, and that was an exquisitely painful experience. <laughs> um, wouldn't do it again. I, I ended up moving back into my work in the publishing industry um, because I found that sort of sitting alone with my thoughts all day was just not for me. Um, and I can, I can write a book and also work otherwise um, and be much more happy that way. So um, yeah, the processes were very different, though I will say both books took me about five years to write each um, from you know, starting to publish. Wow. Oh. Um, I don't know if we had a question of Jennifer Winbury, did we? I don't think we did, right? Um, no. I uh, no, I don't, I didn't. Okay, uh, Jennifer Winbury wants to know, did you ever consider telling the story from the women who were the victims or maybe the prison guard? I'm fascinated by her and her motives. And I have to say, I was thinking of, um, oh God, what was the, uh, the, the story about the woman upstate who let those two guys go? Joyce Mitchell, yeah. Um, uh, she's actually loosely based on Joyce Mitchell. Oh, I that's mm -hmm. I did a lot of research about that case, which was fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and if you guys don't know, Joyce Mitchell is a woman who um, helped two prisoners escape in 2015 in upstate New York. Um, they had basically like seduced her in their own way. And she had a, it's a long story, but um, she, there's a quote that actually Joyce Mitchell said that made it into the book, um, which was, everyone tells me I'm too nice. And I was like, oh. <laughs> everyone tells me I'm too nice. Was that her line? Oh, that's very interesting. Everyone tells me I'm too nice. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, you know, um, Shauna, the character who's, who is the prison guard, um, actually was kind of a later addition to the book. And I, I had thought about making her a perspective character, but I was much more interested in characters more directly related to the crimes he committed. Um, and I think that was the reason she didn't end up becoming a main character, though I think I did draft some of her perspective at one point. As I drafted um, at least a dozen women's perspectives at one point, you know, there was a an adoptive mother um, at one point who is a side character who's had a chapter once. There's a co-worker when Ansel's a teenager who had a chapter once. There's a courtroom illustrator who had a chapter once. And um, I sort of landed on the on the women that felt most organic. Um, yeah. Lainey? Yeah, I think we got to most of the questions are kind of we could talk all day because I know we're all such big fans of this book, but yeah. um, it it truly is a special read, and it's it's there's just so much to dive into, and and also just to like theoretically think about. You know, there's 
think these characters won't leave you for a long time. Um, well, it's that's so true, Lainey. I mean, you can, each one's got its the, their own place uh, in your. It's, they just stay in your head. Oh, and they move that story forward and they fill in the blanks. And there's so many people who are affected by so many other people. And I think that you've really um, done a great a service for all of us um, for, with this book because it's um, uh, it's just it's just such a page turner. And it really does make you think. And um, that we're really excited to have this book under our roof. Thank you so much for writing it. Oh, thank you so much for reading and supporting. You guys really, I, I've just been sort of blown away by the in-house support of this book. It, it's been um, just stunning. I, I've, I've been just, I'm so grateful. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And just a quick plug because we just did a podcast episode. So we have 30 more minutes of deep dive into this book. So everybody <laughs> can go and, and listen to it. We had some fun and, and had a few oh, fun oh. questions. I was like, let's get away a little from <laughs> Wait, and Lainey, when is that going to go up? When will they? This afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So this afternoon you can hear, well, Donya, you're going to come back after we're done speaking with, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. With Sarah. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And to everybody who's watching and, and sending in questions and comments, we'll send, uh, we'll send a, a galley to you. We want you to read it. We want to hear what you have to say. And, uh, you know, if you, and some people have already read it and just loved it. And some people said, oh my God, it was so uncomfortable and so great. Like it just makes you think. So anyway, there we go. And now, now let's bring why? Sarah back in and hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome good, good back. To be back. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> What'd you do while you were gone? I was listening to Danya's uh, amazing conversation with you all, and I I really <laughs> took a lot away from it, especially the discussion about serial killers kind of being people too, which I happen to agree with in insofar as novels and thrillers, I think in particular have really done a lot to elevate serial killers into some kind of boogeyman or some kind of evil figure. I put a lot of that on Thomas Harris with the creation of Hannibal Lecter <laughs> and mm -hmm. how that character evolved from Red Dragon on through Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal and Hannibal Rising and how it, he became less of a person with each subsequent book. So I think what Danya really does so well is just remind us, yeah, these are people, they're kind of boring, they're kind of annoying, they're kind of banal, and they also kill people. And we need to understand the totality of who they are and how they operate and that they are maybe capable of love, even if it's completely warped and they are maybe capable of having some sympathy, even though we should never excuse what they did and we should never forget the harm that they cause. Wow, well said. Yeah. Perfectly said. Let's just close it up. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> no, so perfectly said. And, um, you know, um, getting very tongue tied before uh, when, when we first started, because there's so much to unpack in, in Danya's book and so much to unpack in your book. And for two very different books to touch, uh, to, to share this connective tissue, this raw nerve about um, about the women left in its wake and how, who are those nameless people? That's, I mean, we've got to flip this. And so, um, and, and, the, and the quote that Lainey read at the top of the hour um, says it all. We were discussing this just earlier today and how, um, you know, fiction or nonfiction handled the way you and, and Danya have handled your books, written your books, uh, just brings that message home so clearly and, and um, we thank you for it. So Lainey, I'm gonna hand it over to you for proper introductions. No, that's very well said. And thank you again, Sarah, for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, so a quick introduction. Um, I say quick because we could be here all day saying all of the great things that you do, but I will make it quick. Um, you're the author of the highly acclaimed The Real Lolita, such a good book. If you have not read it, please go read it. Um, editor of Unspeakable Acts, Women Crime Writers, Eight Suspense Novels of the 40s and 50s, and Troubled Daughters, Twisted Wives. You're the current crime columnist for the New York Times Book Review. Um, and this book, Scoundrel, is, I, 
I'm always so impressed by you, but also just appreciate all of your work, Sarah, because you just put in the work to research. There's like a hundred pages of just research <laughs> and footnotes. And it's like, I so appreciate that. This book is, I mean, it's so well written and you feel like you're not, you know, reading stuff that has been researched, but it, it's there. You've done all this research and, and I think I speak for a lot of people who love your work that we really appreciate that you put the time and effort to get things right and tell those women's stories. And this one is no different than the other books. So thank you. That, that means so much to me. Thank you so much. I knew that going into writing Scoundrel, it was going to be a lot different than writing The Real Lolita because with The Real Lolita, I felt like I was mining every little scrap of information and research that I could dig up. And it was to the point where I had to kind of fill in the gaps and that's why I'm more present in the narrative of that book than I am in Scoundrel where if anything, I was kind of drowning in documents between William F. Buckley's papers at Yale and the absolute trove of letters and legal documents and other things that I found there. And then the even more amazing trove of letters in Sophie Wilkins's archive at Columbia University. It wasn't until I found that archive that I even realized that Scoundrel should be a book because at that point I had had the idea for writing something on William F. Buckley and how he became friends with Edgar Smith and how Edgar kind of used him to get free from death row and how this was a catastrophic mistake. I knew there was a story there and I'd wanted to work on it as far back as the end of 2014, but it wasn't until I started reading what Sophie had written and what Edgar and to some extent what Buckley had written to her and felt that there was this strange intellectual triangle that was at the heart of the book. But at the same time, it was also really important to go beyond letters and documents and legal drama to actually figure out who these people were and who are the other women and girls who Edgar harmed. I mean, you start with the original victim, Victoria Zielinski, Vicky was only 15 when he murdered her, to all of the women, most of whom I talk about in the book, some of whom for a variety of reasons I elected not to get into it in great detail, but people like Juliet Scheinman, whom he corresponded with leading up to, and then was immediately involved with after his release, his second wife, Paige, his first wife, Patricia, his daughter, his granddaughter. There were, I mean, it's like, there's a whole series of women who were directly assaulted and, and victimized. And that's not even getting into what happens af after Edgar is released and how he ends up back into prison, which I'm loath to say that there are spoilers in a book that begins in 1957 and effectively ends in 1976 or 77. But at the same time, I really wanted to write Scoundrel as a nonfiction thriller, even if you knew what the outcome was. And that's just part and parcel that I'm so steeped in crime fiction and the techniques of crime storytelling that they were very useful. So in this instance, it's like I had to kind of take everything that I had researched and everybody that I had talked to and distill it down into a narrative where I could step back and just let the chronology take over. And also because there were just so many interesting characters and I wanted them to kind of be at the forefront. So that's a really long-winded answer to what you asked. No, but, it's okay. I mean, well, we're gonna talk about those letters, especially with Sophie, because that's very interesting. But um, yeah, no, I we had talked about this before we went live that I love that the beginning that it's like, this is what's gonna happen. I'm not surprising you because I feel like I read some true crime books and I'm like, you're you're kind of jerking me along to like, get me read to see what happens. And it's like, this is not a mystery. This is someone's life. And so I appreciate that it tells exactly what's gonna happen. But even though you do that, I'm turning the page like, what's gonna happen? Now? Oh, oh, I, I know what the ultimate verdict is gonna be, but I, I, I liked that. And so, you know, from the beginning, exactly what's going to happen. I didn't know that that was going to be the way I framed it until pretty late in the book. But I also knew that it was really important to me that even though the book ended up being titled Scoundrel, that Edgar Smith 
is the least important person in this story. And yet he was presented as the most important person in the story. And I still can't get the quote out of my head that an early writer for National Review who later became, he was a lawyer and then he became, he got involved in other things, but he was the first sort of journalist writer to correspond with Smith and said later when I spoke with him, we just never dreamed that someone who could write so well was a savage killer. And so I thought that to me is the crux. It's this idea that you're conflating intellectual ability or perceived intellectual ability with having some element of humanity and moral weight. And I think we have seen in other stories like what happened with Jack Henry Abbott, who was the prisoner who Norman Mailer befriended and helped get released from prison. And then on the very day that the New York Times published a rave review of Abbott's book, Belly of the Beast, he had been out drinking and got violent and eventually killed a man in a bar and went back to prison and spent the rest of his life there. And Mailer was, I think, understandably and justifiably upbraided for it. But also even with Janet Malcolm's The Journalist and the Murderer, when I, I reread that book every year and every year I take away something different. And while I was reading Scoundrel, I was really struck by how what Malcolm wrote about Joe McGinnis, the writer, and Jeffrey McDonald, the murderer, fam the family murderer, how applicable it was to the story that I was trying to tell about Edgar Smith and William F. Buckley, but that even in these stories, they're so male-centric and it was important to see that there was harm done to so many people in Edgar's orbit. And how do I, as a writer, kind of put that at the forefront so that people can understand that there's real damage done and that their stories need to be told even more. Yes, Thank you. Well, very well said. And I think I I have this underlined because I it it hit me very hard and it's in the middle of the book, but it says, to the criminal, a crime of opportunity isn't personal. The impulse overrides it. I'm I'm skipping a few lines, but the impulse overrides everything. For the victims, the crimes can only be personal. One act of one act with generations of ripple effects. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, I've just found that to be true over and over again in everything I have worked on or written, that we have to grapple with what traumatic events do not just to the person if they are quote lucky enough to survive, but to those who are closest to them, family members, friends, and other loved ones, it really is a, a, a cascading effect that lasts generations. And the fact that this one guy could just do what he did in fits of rage, because that's the thing is like Edgar would commit his crimes because he felt affronted because things weren't working out in his life because Oh, how dare his first wife have a two month old baby and ask that he like actually bear some responsibility and not go out and not be a shiftless reprobate or how dare his second wife suddenly earn more than he did and he couldn't get any traction in his career and everything was about him. And so he would take it out in the worst possible way. And those who bore the, the brunt of it were obviously Vicky Zelensky and later Lisa Osborne. So, and all, not to mention those who were he was married to or those he was involved with. And there was just a, a pattern that I just kept discerning. And so why isn't this talked about as much as his ability to charm in letters and to write publishable books that are of varying quality? And why is that more important than the actual victims here? Yeah, one thing I found really interesting is that they they did comment a lot on like oh he's he writes so well but they'll meet him and <laughs> that did not always transfer from the page <laughs> especially I was watching that interview which we you talk about in the book but everybody can watch it with um uh with Buckley and it's just like oh he's just not really getting his point across here and so I find that really interesting to see such a disparate disparate discrepancy between the page and the person um, take Sophie, for example, who's his editor. Can you talk a little bit about her and their relationship through their letters? So Sophie Wilkins was an editor at Knopf 
She had joined in the late 1950s and as an assistant after being in academia and then not finishing her thesis. She had married a number of times. She had two sons. And her third husband, her Thurman Wilkins, was also an academic and a writer of note. And he had a lot of mental health issues. And Sophie at work was struggling. She didn't really acquire a lot of books. She was trying to sort of figure out where she fit in, the fact that she didn't fit in. She had emigrated from Vienna to the United States when she was 12. She loved culture. She loved opera. She loved music. So she just sort of was a little bit of a fish out of water at Knopf, which was very buttoned up and possibly a little bit on the waspy side. It's uh, hard to discern, but it was just old school publishing in a way that I think to some degree has carried on to a little bit <laughs> in the Knopf way in any case. So she reads a, an article that Buckley had written about Smith for Esquire that was published in the November 1965 issue and writes Buckley a letter saying she wants to contribute to the defense fund because this article argued that Edgar did not kill Vicky Zelinsky and that he deserved a new trial and here were the discrepancies and by the way you can don donate to this defense fund and then I think she eventually sent Edgar a postcard and he replied and but nothing really much came of it and then Edgar tells Buckley that he's working on a book, a nonfiction book about his case, essentially advocating for his own innocence. And Buckley decides to put Edgar in touch with Sophie and the conduit is Edgar's mother, Anne, who's an interesting and fascinating lady in her own right. And in terms of how she always stuck up for her son until finally she no longer could. So at first, the correspondence between Edgar and Sophie is pretty benign. They're just talking about book stuff. And she's telling him about how publishing works and when you might need an agent and the writing life. And then it just started to turn weird. <laughs> and I remember I'm weird sitting in the Columbia University about. archives in like February 2016 thinking I was just going to be reading benign correspondence between an author and editor, but oh no, it got very salacious quite early. And then it just spiraled out of control, I think is a good way of putting it. That's a, that's a great way. That's a very mild way of putting it. It got it's rather amazing. salacious. And, it's uh, amazing how he's, he's uh, you know, he really managed to manipulate some really smart people. I mean, he really did have quite the way about him. And and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, like, what's your take on, on, on Buckley and how, you know, very smart man and, and how, how did that happen? I mean, how did he ingratiate himself into his life? And get, can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I find that just fascinating. I think one thing that's also important to point out is that though there has been much and many books written about William F. Buckley, they tend to concentrate on him as the ideologue, as the political pundit, as the founder of National Review, as the sort of arch father of modern day conservative movement. But they don't really concentrate as much on Buckley the human and the fact what I kept finding is just the ways in which he would let his, I believe, his sincere interest in people and his fervent belief that you could ha have friendship across difference just really screw him up. And I don't really get into it in the book, but con somewhat concurrently to the end of the saga, he was also getting in trouble with the SEC over, um, he had bought some television networks, uh, stations, excuse me. And the person that he entrusted to just made a hash of it and embezzled lots of money and just did terrible, just did really stupid things. So Buckley got in trouble because he just wasn't minding the store because he trusted the wrong people. And so I think it's, it was really interesting to me that he wanted to reach out and help people. And he did believe fervently that Edgar Smith did not kill Victoria Zelinsky, but it's also worth asking who benefited and who deserved Buckley's attention. And why is it that he only showered that attention on someone like Edgar Smith? That's why there's an exchange in the book where they're talking about police brutality and reform and the fact that 
Edgar Smith, who's on death row, who we know has killed a teenage girl, right, has right. better politics on this than Buckley, and is trying to educate Buckley as to why his attitudes might not carry much weight here. So that it just the the dissonance and really kind of blew my mind at times. But I also felt like I got to know Buckley, especially through his correspondence with Sophie and the fact that they became legitimately good friends in the aftermath of everything that happened that I think as I, as I describe it, they were like survivors of a shared war, that they had endured this tra a particular trauma together of being duped. And they had no one else to discuss it with in the same way because no one else could really understand what they had gone through. And even though they stayed friends and Sophie became kind of like a de facto editor on his not later novels, and he was he visited her at, at her deathbed. That's how long it lasted. Like wow. that was an enduring friendship that emerged from knowing Edgar Smith. And so there's a real complexity that I really wanted to try to explore that this wasn't just some like salacious romance between Edgar and Sophie. It was a much more deeply complicated thing that involved all three of them. Right, that's a weird bond. <laughs> That's a very, you know, um, yeah, what, a, what an, uh, an interesting uh, person. And I like that you say his, when you talk about his, um, his book writing and, and his, his perceived talent, uh, because let's face it, after a while, that all dried up anyway. Um, it, you know? once, once Sophie was no longer his book editor, it really showed that yeah. he just didn't have the goods. And I, especially reading his fiction, it was kind of amazing to me how well reviewed A Reasonable Doubt, which was the novel that is, it was really tough going just because of the ways in which he would describe the fictional avatar of Vicky in these horrible terms. And I just felt like my skin crawling as I'm reading them. And, you know, I don't want to say that like books shouldn't be republished or whatever, but I'm also glad that when I had a discussion with his daughter, mostly just because I wanted to know what it was like being having him as her dad mm. and she and the fact that she called him his you know my sperm donor I think was pretty indicative of the relationship that they did not yeah. have yeah but she also is just really blase like yeah whatever do what you want with the letters do what you want with the, whatever you want to republish I have no attachment to this and I I, I don't think she's wrong yeah no correct yeah. Um, sad in the in the bit in the grand obviously in the in the grand picture of it all it's enormously sad um yeah that uh well first of all that he you know that he that these these people lost their lives well she lost her life and then the other yeah but i mean as you say the people in his orbit were so affected going back to Danya's book how many people are affected um you know um Sarah, um, I know we're, we've got people who are watching, but you were going to read a bit from yes. the first chapter. Can we do that? I don't want to sure. miss it, and we'll show uh, Vicky's picture. So this is uh, a little bit from chapter one, which is called Where is Vicky? And just to set it up, I describe a little bit about who Victoria Zielinski was, that she grew up in Bergen County, specifically in um, Ramsey, New Jersey, and she was just like a kid as her best friend later described it. So I wanted to kind of give a sense of the picture and just go from there. One of the last photos of Vicky shows her standing in front of a white door. The camera peers up at her from a low angle. She holds a pair of figure skates in her left hand, the wrist adorned with a white gold Wittenauer watch. Her right hand rests on her hip, a typical pose evident in other photos taken in Vicky's teen years, while her left leg is bent slightly at the knee. She is clad in dark penny loafers, white socks that stop halfway up her shins, a white turtleneck sweater, and a dark shirt whose flared hem brushes against her thighs. Her expression is a Rorschach test for whatever one wishes to read into it. She could be defiant or playful, coy or confident, childlike, or dangerously mature. The gap between her front teeth, plainly visible in photos from earlier in her childhood, is harder to see. And so she seems to teeter on the edge between self-conscious 
and assured. In the photo, at least, radiates promise of something far larger than whatever future seemed possible within the walls of her yellow painted home at 496 Wyckoff Avenue in Ramsey. What kind of life was in store for Victoria Zielinski? Would she have moved away from Bergen County across the Hudson River to Manhattan, that tiny isle bursting with outsized dreams, ready to spit out those who couldn't hack it? Or would she have fled the East Coast altogether for somewhere more far flung? The tragedy of early violent death is that it strips away the person and leaves only the act, the making of the dead girl, rather than the celebration of the lived life. The killer has the power, the one who dies loses it all. Victoria Zielinski not only lost her future, her power and her promise on the night of March 4th, 1957, she lost her existence, overridden by the needs and wants and desires of the man who murdered her. Thank you. Wow. I loved having that photo up too while we were reading that. That was a great tribute. Um, yeah. We have a couple more photos if we want to just show a couple and you can tell us about yeah. them. Um, sorry, I see, I know you just <laughs> took them off and then got to put them back up, but. <clears throat> Hold on one sec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that was Vicky. Um, so this photo was taken in the early 1960s. The woman was Patricia Horton Smith, Edgar's first wife. At this point, she has left New Jersey and is living in Colorado with her second husband, Jean Hafford. And that is Edgar and Patricia's daughter, Patty Ann, when she is a little girl. This is Juliet Scheinman taken in, I think the early 1960s. Juliet had worked a bunch of different jobs, but she always had a hankering to be an actress, sometimes with success, mostly not. And she learned of Edgar's case after reading his book, Brief Against Death, which was published in 1968 and began writing him and also got put in touch with Sophie Wilkins and they were in touch. And so when Edgar was eventually freed in 1971, he and Juliet decided to take their epistolary relationship into real life. And that didn't quite work out as planned. This is Sophie Wilkins and the picture, the photo was taken in her offices at Knopf, probably around 1967, which would have been the time when her relationship with Edgar was at its uh, most fevered pitch, I think is a good way of putting it. So Sophie was at a real loose ends when she began to correspond with Edgar in order to see if he had a book idea, which he did. And the book was Brief Against Death, which was published with quite a lot of success and commercial claim and critical praise. But their relationship was very tempestuous and very strange. And ultimately it did not end well either. So this photo was taken on the set of the firing line. So on the left is William F. Buckley, founder of the National Review, major conservative arch uh, architect. And on the right is Edgar Smith. And this is what a man looks like when he is allowed to wear a suit after 14, nearly 15 years on death row, having been in court to get his freedom. And then they end up in a limousine and take a trip across the Hudson and uh, tape this episode of the firing line, there would, it, which would be in two parts. The one was just Buckley and Smith talking together. And then part two is when a number of journalists and lawyers come on stage and they try to grill Edgar. And yes, you can watch these on YouTube. And this is Paige Heimeyer. This photo was taken in 1972. She had not met Edgar Smith yet. She was something of a prodigy. She was very musically inclined and very, as you can see, she was very young. I think like Patricia, they were very tiny. I think maybe five foot even tops. And she met Edgar at a bar in Bergen County and he was 20 years older if not more. 
and she had never had a serious relationship before and they got married they had moved out to california and uh as you can surmise things did not work out so well either seems to be a pattern <laughs> yeah it certainly is and then the, finally this photo which was from 1957 um yeah this is young edgar smith and i believe he had just been sentenced to death and is taken to he's be, he's on his way to prison and you can sort of see the difference between him at 23 and him having served nearly 15 years and on death row and what what that does but also just this was what he looked like and this is how how he was thank you for walking us really. amazing isn't it see the difference in him, you know, some swagger there. Um, yeah. We have some questions that we'd like to get to. Uh, Nora Rollinson, uh, founder of Early Word yes. Librarian and- uh, Lovely to record her name. Yes, she's wonderful. Uh, she says, hi, Sarah, you know, I'm a fan. Uh, as I've said before, your troubled daughter's twisted wives should be required reading for all readers advisors. Thank you. That, that collection still means so much to me and I'm always glad when it finds new readers. And I, th I think it's done a lot to sort of shape how we view women crime writers of a certain time. And if not for troubled daughters, I don't think the term domestic suspense would have been popularized. <laughs> so yeah, it's it definitely changed the course of my career publishing that anthology and I will forever hold it dear as a result. Well, yes, and thank you, Nora, for, for, for bringing that up. Uh, we have more questions. Essie Laney? Yeah, there's one by Maureen Roberts. Um, in your research, were you able to talk to any of Victoria's family members, especially her younger sister, who was a witness? I was, but they ultimately so the sister that is being referred to is Myrna and Myrna is still alive as is Mary, the eldest sister, but they ultimately decided not to participate in the book, although they know about it. I was in touch with Mary's, one of Mary's daughters who did talk to me and just gave me some context and also supplied me with a couple of the photos that are included in Scoundrel. So I'm I'm basically waiting until the finished copies come in and then I can send them and see what they think because Vicky's family, like she didn't grow up in a in an idyllic situation at all. Like there was abuse, there was violence, there was alcoholism mental illness I mean it's it's not a great story but it's also a story that needed to be told that the fullness of Vicky's life cut short as it was um it just it, it matters it matters in the same I was very mindful while working on this that Vicky was the same age as Sally Horner who was the subject of my first book The Real Lolita when Sally died and that only a few years had passed between Sally's death in 1952 and Vicky's murder in 1957. And it, so many of the attitudes were still very much present and not really in a good way. And I still feel like I'm kind of unpacking what that all means in the context of both those books and just generally in my work. Yeah, there um, are some comments. Uh, it says, yeah, Vicky Nesting, you seem to find such interesting angles into crime nonfiction. Thank you for bringing these stories to us. Kimberly McGee agreed that she really liked at the beginning, everything was kind of laid out and then we got into it more. She also asked, she said, I just started Scoundrel, but what a wild tale. How does this guy get all of these people to believe in him? What an intention hound that he has to go um, back to his evil ways uh, after the interest in him dies down. So she said, what amazing suckers we are. <laughs> I mean, the story of America is the story of being grifted and also it's the story of murder and violence. So I guess this book, it really is an intersection of all of everyone's obsessions, but it was hard not to think of grifts and murder and violence over in light of what we've kind of endured over the last 
few years, but also just generally, like we just keep falling for <laughs> certain cons and some of them really cause lasting damage. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I mean, in the moment too, it's easy for us to set back and say, how could you fall for this? But in the moment, I'm sure it was more nuanced and to, to be thinking of it while it was happening. Um, and I know we're kind of running out of time, but I did want to ask you a little bit about uh, your correspondence. With ah, them. yes. So I feel like I kind of reverse the narrative a little bit because I started, I sent a letter to Edgar while he was in prison in California, really almost as soon as I decided that this was a project that I wanted to pursue. And so initially I thought that this was going to be another long form article for a publication called Hazlitt, which had published the long form version of the real Alita, which later became the book. So this was supposed to be my follow-up and, you know, in doing so, I do my due diligence. I try to get into Buckley's archives, which didn't pan out until many years later. And I start reading newspapers and then I, I real, and I get some other documents and I realize that Edgar's just not going to tell me very much that I don't know. He won't have insight into why he did it. He won't reveal anything new. Um, just pe sociopaths are kind of boring and they don't really, they don't really have a lot to say other, other than grandiosity and trying to flatter and trying to cajole and trying to charm. And I'm just, I'm not immune to charm, no one is, but I just, I'm very skeptical and suspicious of it. So I wrote the first letter just explaining, I was working on a project and I knew that he had been friends with Buckley and what did he want to tell me? And I get this incredibly ebullient letter back around the Christmas holidays just saying, you were the first person who ever wrote me from Brooklyn because that's where I was living at the time. <laughs> and just a whole lot of other blather. And then he's like, how did you know that I, my health is bad. And so in my second letter, I just was like in a bad mood or something. I don't, e I don't even recall totally, but I just wrote, you know, I was quoting from parole records about his health. And just, so I just sent him a quote about that, that he wanted to die, die, die. And I just was like, well, it's right here. Uh, and I also just said, it's funny that you answered, you know, answered all my questions, even though I'm a journalist and you say you don't want to talk to journalists. And here are some other people who have died in the interim, which you didn't know. So the second letter you wrote back, which was much more subdued, I think he genuinely felt something about knowing that certain people in his life had died, especially I think, I don't think he knew until I said so that Sophie had died. And then seemed a little bit more reticent, but I just felt like if I engaged with him any further, it would just not be helpful. And I thought, okay, let me just send a list of questions that I knew had not been asked that I wanted to know. And so I did that. And a few, a few weeks later, I get this very huffy response, like, you, you seem to be working on a book and I don't want any part of this. And then proceeded to answer every question almost like he couldn't help himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then I didn't write him back. That's all there is to say about that. Oh, oh, Edgar. But that, yeah. that's just fascinating, yeah. So thank you for yeah. talking about that a bit. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, that brings a, a level of, uh, you know, as it's of intimacy in a weird, creepy way um, that, uh, but he's so, but he's also seems so transparent in a way. You know, like at first he's flattered and he wants to try and get on your good side. Oh, somebody from Brooklyn is writing to me and he's, you know, he's he's trying to charm and then then he's, you know, I don't know. Um, we have we have time for one last question. Essie, there's a question uh, from uh, Sylvia. Can you ask that? And then we'll bring Danya back. Yes, um, she, Sylvia wants to know, how does writing these tales affect you mentally? Does anything shock or surprise Surprise you? Oh, things shock and surprise me all the time. And I think, I think it's just really important that I try to take breaks from the material and from the work whenever I can, whether it's reading, going for walks, spending time with people I love, um, 
I was able to finish the first draft of this at the very, very beginning of the pandemic and then worked on subsequent drafts and edits throughout. So there was a lot of stop and start. And I just find that even though I think I'm sort of naturally resilient, I also have really tried to take a lot of time and space to kind of fortify that. And also, you know, you got to feel your feelings and this is tough work, but it's also so important for me to tell these stories and just illuminate what people have gone through in the best way that I can and to just do so with some degree of empathy and humility. So that, you know, knowing that just feels, it feels so important for me to do that, that I'm able not to bury what I'm feeling or concurrent, whatever concurrent trauma that I have had, but just to, you know, put it in the comp- proper context and also rest a lot. I'm good at, I'm good at sleeping. I'm good at resting. Well, I'm saying, I, you know, I thought about that myself, like, what does this do to your head? I mean, you know, all of the books that, that you've written, I mean, they're so important and um, as important as it is for you to write them, it's important for them to be read. It's important for the stories to be told um, and for us to honor them in a way to know who they are. And so, um, but um, I'm glad that you take, a, that you can take your breaks. And, and also I just want to give a shout out to you, Sarah, for being so supportive of, of libraries and you've been, you know, so wonderful and come to the American Library Association, anything that you ask, we ask you to do, you do it. And we just so appreciate everything that, that you've done for, um, for us, for librarians, for readers. Um, Thank you. That means yes. such a great deal. I love libraries. I've always loved libraries. I, I, I think I said to my publicist the other day that I will pretty much do whatever Harper Library asks, you know, within reason. But um, <laughs> but you, you you all do you also you all do such wonderful work, and it's so obvious how much you love books and how much you love the people who write them, and and especially just the that you, you're reader focused, and that's so important. Mm. Thank you for saying that. That's really lovely, and and it's true. We do feel that way. We we you know we uh, we treasure um, our authors, and especially when books like yours. And I'm not just saying that. I mean these are these are important books. These are stories that need to be told. And and uh, with a pen in your hand, we know that um, they will be told you know, respectfully, responsibly, and beautifully, effectively, and powerfully. So we really do thank you so much um, for this book and for all your books. Um, so I wish we could go on, but we can't. But everybody who's watching and commenting, we will send a, a, a galley to you because we want you to, um, to, to dive in if you haven't already. And uh, this is just a spectacular book. Um, and now, shall we, Lainey and Essie, bring Danya back for a, you know, a, big, a little roundup. Uh, and now, shall we, Lainey and Essie, bring Danya back for a, you know, a big oh, Danya, you probably have to close out of the. Uh, and now, shall we, Lainey? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. It happens. It's usually me that does that, so don't no, feel. It's me who does that before. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. So much for having me, Sarah. Um, I'm gonna remember the quote, the story of America is the story of being grifted. I feel like that's just gonna stick in my head forever. So thank you. <laughs> it's true though. It is, it's amazing. <laughs> so thank you for that. And thank you guys so much for having us. This was wonderful. It really was. Oh, uh, it was it was great to to have you both on and to again, you know, to talk about uh you know, this, as I was saying in the beginning, and uh, just this, this intersection, nonfiction, fiction, the stories of, um, yes, of the people who commit the crimes, but more importantly, the people whose lives are affected by it. Those are the people that we want to know about. And you've done that. And um, I, there, as, as, as the uh, PW says about scoundrel and can, uh, certainly does apply to, to Danya's book, um, Notes on an Execution. It's, uh, it's th- th- that um, those who he murdered or came close to murdering were far and away more uh, fascinating, complex and worth knowing, far more than he was. And when I say this, I say to both of you, to the, to the people of whom, of whom you write, that um, we're done glorifying them and, and you have seen to that. And so 
We thank you both so much. Um, Lainey, do we want to go one last time about pub dates and on sales and all that fun stuff? Because I don't have that in front of me. Oh, well, I do. So Donia's book uh, goes on sale January 25th and uh, notes on the execution and Scoundrel goes on sale February 22nd. So Library Reads voters, remember that. Also, uh, Lainey has done a, a, another wonderful interview with um, an author, Donya Kukafka, and you'll be able to check that out later today, Lainey, on uh, Harper Library's uh, podcast. Yeah, and we actually, Sarah and I did one for Unspeakable Act, so I'll- We did, it was right too. before everything shut down and changed. My it God, that's person. right. <laughs> Yeah, let's we'll put that in the uh, in the in the notes well and on and back on the, the library uh, the podcast link. We'll put yeah. that in there because that was great. That was really great. Uh, well, is there anything anybody wants to say before we hang up? I've got to run, but thank you guys so much you for too. having me. This was wonderful, and it was so nice to meet you finally, Sarah. <laughs> Likewise, and yeah. thank you just for everything and. Well, you know, I just look forward to seeing both of our books be published in the it, it, as well as they as they clearly seem to be doing yes. so far. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching today. And uh, we'll be back next week uh, for another episode of Door to Door. Lady Essay. Mwah! Bye, all. <laughs>